the CTA. And uh, I will also uh, discuss a little bit about the Astra Mini Array that will be a CTA precursor. Uh, so uh, the contents of this talk will be essentially a very brief overview on CTA concept and CTA performance that was already introduced by Vito. And then I will discuss in more detail the CTA in science, in astrophysics and beyond. And then the Astra Mini Array, the CTA precursor. So, uh, 30 years ago, this, is, was, this was the, the high-energy gamma-ray sky, right? With a single source, Krabby, Krabby Nebula, the Krab Pulsar, right? And, uh, okay, nowadays, the TV sky is like this. Uh, the pointer, where is the pointer here? This one? Okay. Uh, uh, so, you see, uh, these are galactic sources and extragalactic ones. The galactic sources are supernova remnants, um, um, pulsar wind nebula, X-ray binaries, massive star clusters, and the extragalactic ones are essentially, essentially active galactic nuclei and starburst galaxies. We are going to discuss all these be beasts, right? The, these sources, but I, I think most of you are familiar with them. And this sky that we see today was probed by these TV observatories that Victor already mentioned before. So essentially, we have the Sherenkov telescope fa facilities, uh, Veritas, Veritas Magic, and um, HES, and also the Hawk and Lazo that have these water tanks that are also sensitive to Sherenkov. So it, all these are gamma ray detectors. And, and then you may ask, OK, you have this fantastic sky on, on gamma rays nowadays, so how... Uh, what did I do? Where is Tiago? <laughs> ah, so I, I think I... Uh, let me see. Okay, okay, okay. Now I'm back. And um, why to build CTA? Because essentially CTA will provide a full sky coverage with these two sites, one in the north in La Palma and the other one in Chile, and uh, also improve on sensitivity, on angular re resolution for the first time. We are going to have arc minute uh, uh, minute angular resolution, 10% uh, of energy resolution, the wide energy range that we will cover from, from 20 GVs up to 300 TVs, and when I'm talking about TV, I'm talking about 10 to 12 electron volts, and GV, 10 to 9 electron volts. And also, the field of view is going to be improved, and uh, this full sky coverage, right? And, um, okay, so, uh, what is the science that CTA will, allows us, that will allow us to make? Uh, let's discuss the major questions in astrophysics and beyond. So the concept is uh, three major topics, cosmic ray particle acceleration, probing extreme environments, and phys uh, physics frontiers. In this first term, we are going to explore the cosmic particle accelerators in, in the universe, because these are the ones that will produce the gamma rays. Uh, so the questions that we want to answer how and where are particles are accelerated? How do they propagate? And what is, is the impact of these um, uh, gamma rays and particles on the environment? Uh, probing extreme environments, we want to understand the physical processes close to the cosmic ray accelerators, like neutron stars and black holes. And we will be able to explore the characteristics of relativistic jets, winds, and explosions that are the responsible for these particles, for, for, for the production of these particles and these high-energy gamma rays, right? High-energy photons. And also, we are going to explore cosmic voids. Uh, why is that so? Because the gamma ray radiation that is produced in these sources is able to travel through the environment, the intergalactic medium, and then we, uh, they will interact with the background radiation fields and the background magnetic fields. Whatever is there, we are going to be able to probe with the CTA key capabilities. And also physics frontiers. What is the nature of dark matter particles? This is going to be explored in the CTA framework. Is the light speed constant or not, or the so-called 
uh, uh, Lorentz uh, invariance violation, and also if there are or not these uh, axon-like particles predicted by quantum gravity. So, uh, we are going to discuss uh, all, all these topics uh, very briefly, but you are going to have uh, lots of details and further discussion along this week as well, right? So, let's move on, because we have lots of things to discuss. Uh, as Victor mentioned, we are going to start construction of the CTA with this so-called alpha configuration, with a number, uh, with four uh, large size telescopes and nine me intermediate si middle size telescopes in the uh, northern site. And uh, this array with 40 small size telescopes and 14 middle size telescopes in Chile, in the southern array. Uh, this uh, configuration will allow to do this uh, fantastic uh, 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 physics. Uh, exploring, but l let me just remind you that uh, these uh, different uh, uh, sizes of telescopes were meant to make uh, a full coverage of, uh, of, um, of uh, science because, the, uh, as Victor mentioned, the large size telescopes will be able uh, to probe the lowest energies in gamma rays for from more distant objects, so the faintest and uh, more distant ones, and the SSTs will probe the brightest and closest mainly, right? And the intermediate telescopes will probe intermediate, right? Will be intermediate. So we are going to explore all the energy range with these different sizes, and um, uh, essentially they will explore all these uh, physical objects and environments in, um, in these uh, energy ranges, right? Um, okay, just uh, a, a, a comment. Uh, what, what is going on that it doesn't move? Hmm? It's not moving forward. What is going on? I think we are running out of battery. Tiago, please. <laughs> Yeah, we, we ran out of battery. This always happens with me, by the way. <laughs> I, I think I'm going to call them. Sorry. Bateria. No, I think... Eu acho que é bateria mesmo. It stopped all of a sudden. So you see all, all the, the science that we will be able to explore, um, sources at cosmological distances with the LST in the LST range, uh, up to extreme cosmic ray accelerators in our galaxy with the SSTs. Ah, okay, I think they are going to... Because it's okay, okay, N now it's working. Okay, back to uh, ba back to the, the the presentation. Okay, so uh, uh, I would like to we we were discussing about these uh, 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 telescope prototypes. Just a, 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 a comment that. You know, uh, Brazil has been participating in the development of these uh, instruments, in particular CBPF in Rio de Janeiro, contributed to the optical aligned system development for the large size telescopes. The Institute of Physics in São Carlos uh, 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 contributed to the development of the camera support structure for the middle size telescopes. And we here in IAG, we contributed to the end-to-end -end development and construction of these small-sized telescopes, these so-called ASTRI telescopes. Uh, okay, let, let's move on. So, showing that we are not only participating in science, but also instrumental development. But uh, Vitor has shown this one, the comparative performance sensitivity of CTA compared with the other 
other current facilities. And it's important to emphasize that you see, here, these curves, the, the lower, the better, right? The sensitivity. But in the uh, Fermi LAT region, we see that the sensitivity of Fermi uh, is, 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 is better in these low energies. Nevertheless, the sensitivities for 10 years of the Fermi LAT satellite exposure, while uh, for CTA, these curves are for 50 hours of exposure. So, for instance, on time scales of hours, CTA will have 1,000 to 1 million better sensitivity than, than Fermi at these uh, small energies, right? Uh, and also, in the large energy tail, you, you have that lazo after one year exposure, is really uh, has a better uh, sensitivity than CTA, right? Nevertheless, this is one year and this is 50 hour. And again, uh, these uh, experiments are complementary, as Victor mentioned, right? And uh, the, uh, the angular resolution, in any case, will be better than ever uh, 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 for CTA as compared to the current instruments. And even more compared with the Hulk and Lazo tank experiments, because these instruments have very poor angular resolution. OK, so let's move on. Here, we, uh, for you to have an idea of the field of view of CTA, this is Centaurus wave, which is a radio galaxy. And so uh, the field of view of CTA is, is going to be so good that we will be able to uh, see extended sources, right, for the first time, to resolve extended sources. And the, uh, if we zoom in into the nuclear region of the source and improve this zooming by 80 times, this is going to be the, 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 the field of view that CTA will be able to solve in the nuclear region of, of the source, right? With a, uh, this is the angular re resolution at TVs that you can compare with the poorer angular res resolution of Fermilat at 10 GVs and the even worse resolution of LASO at, at uh, 100 TVs. Okay, so uh, back to our science case. Let's discuss these, uh, these um, science issues that CTA proposes, right? This, uh, as uh, uh, Victor mentioned, uh, we have envisioned, in order to allow to explore this uh, science case that I showed, these major themes, we have envisioned these key science projects to be developed in the next 10 years after the initial of the, of the operation of CTA. Uh, and they are uh, presented in, in this book that we published in 2019. And uh, so this, uh, the science cases are, are these ones that Victor already mentioned. We are going to survey the galactic century uh, of our galaxy, of course. Uh, we will do a galactic plane survey. We will search for cosmic ray pavatrons that are the accelerators mainly in the galaxy, in our galaxy, star-forming systems, which are the cradles of uh, cosmic ray accelerators, uh, as we are going to see. Uh, the the low the large Magellanic cloud the satellite um, uh, galaxy in the in the neighborhood of our own galaxy survey that also was mentioned before the extra galactic survey we are going to make an extra galactic survey uh, monitoring of several active galactic nuclei we are, we are going to explore transient sources with high variability like flares gamma ray bursts etc. Uh, gravitational wave flares, etc., clusters of galaxies, and also the dark matter program. So let's discuss these issues a little bit. In this diagram, this cartoon shows, illustrates this uh, key science project, these key science projects from the galaxy to extragalactic uh, scales. Uh, so, for instance, uh, we are going to have this galactic plane survey explore the galactic century of our galaxy, the dark matter program that we will start in our own galaxy, uh, start forming uh, systems uh, within the galaxy and in extragalactic uh, systems, and also explore uh, sources, individual sources like cosmic ray acceleration accelerators that we know that we have in our galaxy, like supernova remnants. And just to remind you, a supernova remnant is the product of a, when a, a massive star uh, ends up its life, it explodes, ejects 
its uh, outer envelopes that produce a, a shock front, a spherical shock front, front that propagates into the interstellar medium. And this shock front is the site, is a site for cosmic ray acceleration and therefore gamma ray production. And what remains in the core of, of these explosions uh, of uh, a massive star is uh, a neutron star. So uh, these neutron stars, uh, you know, in the beginning of their life, they spin very fast, they produce pulsars. These pulsars emit winds, relativistic winds, the pulsar uh, wind nebulae. So we have all these sites because these winds are also appropriate for accelerated particles. So they are also gamma ray emitters. And extragalactic objects like active galactic nuclei. You know that galaxies, active galaxies, host supermassive black holes in their nuclear region. These black holes produce accretion disks and jets, and these jets and accretion disks are able to also accelerate particles, are, as we are going to see. So they are also cosmic ray accelerators. Uh, and also, all, you know, star forming regions have, um, are the cradles of. Uh, stars, of massive stars, and therefore of supernova remnants, winds of massive stars, all this bunch of uh, systems that are able to produce um, gamma rays. So therefore, star-forming regions, also, uh, both in our galaxy and in external galaxies, like starburst galaxies that have a star formation rate that is uh, at least 10 times bigger than the, the star formation rate of our, our own galaxy, are also very good cradles for cosmic ray accelerator, acceleration and gamma ray production, right? So we have uh, all these, uh, these uh, fantastic objects to explore, including also transient sources that we are going to discuss in a, minute, in a few minutes as well. So uh, uh, with these um, key science projects, let's start to see how these key science projects uh, by CTA, we'll be able to probe all those uh, major themes or topics that I mentioned. So we're starting with cosmic particle acceleration, accelerators. Um, as I mentioned before, the particles to be accelerated to very high energy, they need extreme environments like supernova explosions, neutron stars, black holes, and the relativistic outflows that these systems uh, are able to produce or supersonic outflows. The <clears throat> major questions that we want to answer in this uh, topic are, uh, are the following: are the following supernova remnants are the main cosmic ray accelerators in our galaxy or not? Where in our galaxy are really particles uh, accelerated up to the uh, threshold energies for the galaxy that? Uh, for cosmic rays in the galaxy around 10 to 15 electron volts. Uh, 10 to 15 e electron volts mean PEV, PV energies. And these accelerators, we call them pevatrons, right? So uh, what are the pevatrons in our galaxy? And what are the sources of ultra high energy cosmic rays? Those that may attain energies up to 10 to 20, 21 electron volts that are observed. Probably extragalactic origin, probably AGN somehow. To answer to these questions, we have uh, envisioned these key science projects, including the galactic and extragalactic surveys, deep observations of nearby sources, galaxies and clusters, and precise measurements of targets, bright targets to probe the physical processes, right? So we study some sources in, in, in depth. Uh, so what we want, essentially, when exploring cosmic particle accelerator, accelerators is to make a census, a census of them in, in, across all the scales, from supernova remnants inside our own galaxy or neighbor uh, 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 galaxies, star-forming regions that are the cradle of supernova remnants, uh, neighbor galaxies, star-forming galaxies like M31, uh, the large Magellanic Cloud. Starburst galaxies that I mentioned are galaxies with a high star formation, much higher than normal galaxies like us, like ours, that have a, a, a huge rate of star formation, and therefore they produce uh, several uh, 
cosmic ray accelerators, and they induce a galactic wind that is pushed by supernova remnants, by, by supernova explosions. And also um, the active galactic nuclei, and also uh, that host uh, accretion disks and relative viscous jets, and also the so-called gamma ray bursts. Gamma ray bursts are the most violent events in the universe. They are produced in cosmological distances, and what we believe is that they are produced from the merge between neutron stars or black holes that form at the end a black hole engine that emanate, that, uh, in, that produces uh, super relativistic jets that impinge into the environment. And then they produce gamma ray bursts, and after low emission, that is observed in, in, with the, in, in several wavelengths, right? So, and these are very highly variable transient uh, uh, phenomena, and CTA will probe them as well, as well as galactic, uh, uh, clusters of galaxies. So we have these um, sensors across all cosmic scales for cosmic particle accelerators. And um, <clears throat> the, the galactic plane survey, what's gonna, what we are going to see when we move from current instruments like HES to CTA for the same time of exposure, we are going to see much more sources along our galactic plane, right? For you to have an idea, this is the simulated uh, uh, sources that uh, CTA will be able to see between a longitude of minus uh, 80 to 480 degrees, to plus 8 degrees. And the, if we zoom into this region within 20 degrees, we are going to see this. And if we zoom into this uh, region uh, around the, the century of our galaxy, we are going to see this around Sagittarius, that is our own black hole. You know, we have the supermassive one million, two million black hole super sitting in the center of our galaxy. And the, if, we, we, if we put a mask here, we can see the diffusion, the details of the diffusion emission in the galactic century as well. This diagram shows the number of sources that will be discovered, uh, new sources by CTA. This is the known sources, right? Currently known sources. And this is the total amount of new sources that um, include binary systems, uh, uh, pulsar wind nebula. These binaries are compact systems uh, of uh, binary stars that probably host a neutron star or a black hole and produce gamma rays as well. Uh, uh, pulsar wind nebula, e e e young, young um, supernova remnants, interacting supernova in, in, in red, and, and all, all, all these sources will be, let's say, surveyed and discovered. New sources are predicted with these uh, simulations that we are doing within the CTA collaboration. Okay, so let, let, let's talk about the search for pevatrons. As I mentioned, uh, a cosmic ray, uh, for a cosmic ray to be able to produce photons with 100 TVs, it should have at least an energy around PVs, 10 to 15 electron volts or so. Right? So that's why we call these accelerators pevatrons, right? Uh, I, I, must, I should mention that photons with these energies are preferentially produced by hadronic processes. So cosmic rays that are protons rather than electrons. This uh, because the cross-section for electrons interacting with photons to produce gamma rays uh, through inverse Compton uh, scattering, decreases very quickly for energies above 10 to TVs due to the Kleinishian effect that I, I know that you have seen already in quantum mechanics, right? So, uh, preferentially, we might expect to have hadronic processes, so cosmic rays of ions like protons, right? And the interactions that, they, that can produce gamma rays are uh, the scattering of these cosmic ray protons with the background photons, low energy photons, and they can scatter these photons to gamma rays, right? Low energy photons to high energy photons, or proton-proton interactions, right? Uh, meaning a proton interacting with the background proton of less energy 
it will also produce gamma rays. This cartoon summarizes these, uh, you know, interactions, hadronic and leptonic. So hadronic, as I mentioned, uh, photohadronic process is a, a cosmic ray proton, high energy proton interacting with a background photon. This produces pions and then gamma rays and also neutrinos and electron positron pairs. So you have this cascading with all the zoo of particles. Uh, interactions of protons with background uh, low energy protons also produce gamma rays and neutrinos. And uh, for the leptonic process involving electrons, you have pair creation out of the interaction of a gamma ray with a background low energy photon, electron positron pair. Synchrotron cooling, that is the acceleration of electron positrons in the background magnetic field, produce synchrotron photons that are background low energy photons. And these low energy photons can be inverse Compton scattered by the same relativistic electrons to produce gamma rays. Right? So we have all these processes to produce gamma rays. We know already how to do them. And uh, let, move, let me move, oh, sorry, too fast. So, uh, let me mention that LASO has recently discovered pevatrons in our galaxy, actually 12 sources emitting at several hundreds of TVs, and one of them up to 1.4 PV in gammas, right? What are the pevatrons, the cosmic ray accelerators of these sources? We don't know yet, because the resolution of LASO is so poor, the angular resolution, that they were able only to classify one of the sources out of 12, right? So we don't know. Uh, the, the best candidates, of course, are supernova remnants, the galactic center, maybe it's Sagittarius, uh, the, the black hole, pulsar wind nebula, young stellar clusters, we don't know yet. So CTA will have the capability of identifying and probe morpho morphology and spectra for these sources, right? Um, okay, so the, galact the primary goals of the galactic uh, uh, plane survey will be really to provide the census of sources of pevatrons uh, or cosmic ray accelerators for our galaxy to provide a multi-purpose catal catalog and a detailed study also of the diffuse, diffuse emission, that is, if you subtract the, the contribution of gamma rays from the sources, all that, uh, the rest is the diffuse emission, right? And this study is important to study what? To explore the transport theories of cosmic rays and also to subtract these physical contributions, these astrophysical contributions, in order to explore dark matter, right? Uh, what, what remains may be dark matter signals. We are going to talk about this a little bit more in detail in a few minutes. If I can move on. Oh, it's stuck again. It's probably I need the. <laughs> oh. Tiago? <laughs> okay, guys, I, th I think I'm going to move uh, here. It's no, let me see. No, oh, sorry. This I'm so late with my talk. Okay, this is an example of um, um, uh, uh, what uh, CTA will be do to resolve individual sources like supernova remnants. So, here we have uh, 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 CTA will be uh, this is a simulated. Um, a simulation by C CTA uh, of the supernova remnant for two emission scenarios. One is uh, if the emission is dominated by, uh, by electrons, lep leptonic emission, or if it's dominated by protons. And you see that morphologically they look very different. So that CTA will be able to different the differentiate between these scenarios, right? This at the TV uh, uh, regime, right? Um, this was mentioned by Victor. Uh, CTA will be able to do a global survey of uh, LMC uh, satellite galaxy. This is the view, the current view of gamma ray uh, sources in LMC, and this is what um, CTA will see 
after 300 hours of, uh, of observations, right? Um, and so it, it will explore, it will discover more than 60 supernova remnants and also uh, post-serene nebula, etc. And we will be able to uh, have a, a vision of the diffusion emission to study particle transport. Um, now, moving to extragalactic domains, we are going to uh, perform an extragalactic survey, as I mentioned, and this is going to be the first ever done at very high energies. And uh, we are going to cover one-fourth of the, of, of, of the sky, and in red here, you see the new, so the new sources, extragalactic sources that CTA, this is a simulation, of course, that CTA will be able to probe, and also those in the galactic plane for the, from the galactic plane survey. The green uh, dots here represent the known sources nowadays, right? So this will allow to explore extreme blazers, discovers uh, new galaxy clusters, probably, and... Um, uh, uh, high variability sources, and to do multi-messenger science as well, because we can do follow-ups of uh, neutrino and uh, gravitational wave triggers, or vice versa, right? Okay, so uh, this is a representation in this cartoon of all the targets, in, in, uh, extragalactic targets, right, that I mentioned before. So we are going to explore radio galaxies, uh, blazers, Blazers are also active uh, galactic nuclei, but they are very luminous, in general very distant, distant, and uh, their jets point to our line of sight. And that's why they are the most frequent observed gamma ray emitters, right? We are going to talk a lot about them in a minute as well. And also, as I mentioned before, GRB, uh, we are we're going to explore uh, gamma ray bursts, and uh, galaxy clusters, and uh, external uh, galaxies with uh, high star formation, like starburst galaxies, and uh, the interactions of the gamma rays with the environment. Um, so, uh, okay, um, here we have um, uh, the CTA differential flux sensitivity, which shows that uh, the CTA will be orders of magnitude more sensitivity, more sen sensitive than Fermilat, for instance, to explore time variability. So uh, CTA will be a high energy transient monitor and uh, able to solve um, time scales within one day, within seconds, right? And um, so it will be excellent to explore transient sources. By transient, I mean all diverse population of astrophysical objects that produce high variability in time um, uh, emission, right? Some of them are high energy emitters in gamma rays, others are uh, dominating neut in neutrinos and gravitational waves, but all these possible targets will be investigated, including gamma ray bursts, AGNs with high variability, Pulsary nebula, binary accretion, and relative scout flows. All these uh, classes of objects will be e uh, explored. Uh, wh what I mean by exploring variability with CTA, for instance, this is uh, the simulated light curve. Light curve is flux as a function of time. For a source that exhibits high variability observed in low gamma rays energies by Fermilat, we extrapolate it to TV energies, and this is the expected vari variability of a few hundred seconds. Of, uh, and this is the expected variability for a gamma ray burst, a famous one that has been explored in very uh, distant one with the redshift Z equal 4. And this is also a time scale resolution of uh, seconds. What we can explore uh, what physical processes we can infer from this variability. This is what I'm going to discuss when discussing AGN monitoring. So CTE will, do, will try to answer questions like, uh, for sources like this that produce an accretion disk and these relativistic jets, what are these jets made of? What is the chemical composition? What is uh, how they are launched? What causes the variability? 
and what information we can get from this variability, and what is the acceleration mechanism of the cosmic rays in these sources. In order to answer to these questions, we are going to perform this long-term monitoring of selected agents over 10 years. We are going to follow up flaring agents and high-quality measurements of selected samples that are very well known in order to probe physical processes around the black holes, right? How? So, for instance, uh, to answer this question, uh, CTA will be able, from the spectrum, the shape of the spectrum will tell us if the beam is dominated by electron-positron pairs or by nuclei, by protons, right? The shape and the threshold energy, the maximum energy, are dis distinct for in both cases. So from the spectrum, we can get this information. Um, also, when we talk about agent variability, we can study or explore where the emission come from, comes from in the jet uh, and uh, associate this with the jet launching process and the acceleration mechanism. How? Variability. You know, a high variability of 200 seconds or so for a, for a uh, source like this, a blazer, where the jet points to our line of sight. With this high variability, we know that the emission region has to be extremely compact because causality uh, arguments tell us that the emission region cannot exceed the size of, uh, uh, of, uh, of, 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 of delta T times C, right? The, 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 the region that is emitting is equal at, at most equal to C times the variability time because of causality. So, in this sense, if, this, uh, if the region is extremely compact, for 200 seconds we, we conclude that this emission is of the order of, of, of the distance that the photon will take to cross the black hole. Or in other words, the size is of the order of the, of the accretion disk, of the inner region, so this probably tells us that the emission comes from the inner regions of the jet. Another point is that if this emission comes from the inner region, we know from theory that these jets are born magnetically dominated. So they are born with the magnetic fields, and then they, they turn into kinetically dominated, with the, where magnetic fields are not anymore so important, and shocks are very frequent, right? So, in the inner regions, uh, if, uh, if these uh, cosmic rays are produced in the inner regions, so we might expect to have a mechanism for acceleration of the cosmic rays that we call magnetic reconnection. If they are uh, produced further out, shock acceleration may prevail, right? Um, uh, for, uh, for you guys that are not so familiar with this uh, acceleration process, let me make a parenthesis here. So, in both cases, we know that particles are accelerated stochastically by a process that we call Fermi process. Either if we are in a shock front, that is a velocity discontinuity, particles that are trapped in this shock front will suffer head-on collisions with magnetic fluctuations in this shock front, and then they will get accelerated stochastically by this Fermi process, having after each round trip an energy increase that is proportional to the shock velocity divided by C. Likewise, in reconnection discontinuities or magnetic discontinuities, here we have a magnetic field in magnetically dominated regions. If we have magnetic fields of opposite polarity here in, in red and blue encountered, encountering each other, we have a magnetic discontinuity. And in this magnetic discontinuity, particles trapped there will also suffer head-on collisions like in this case and suffer this Fermi process with the uh, acceleration very efficient. So, in either case, we may have uh, particles being accelerated. And it occurs that if the particles are... Oops, sorry. If the particles are being accelerated in the magnetically dominated region, so magnetic reconnection may prevail, may be dominant. And as a matter of fact, in this simulation that we performed in our group, uh, we have a relativistic jet 
we injected particle, test particles, and these particles were accelerated in situ up to energies of 10 to 16 or to 10 to 20 electron volts. So we know that we can produce cosmic rays at those energies there. And CTA is studying the physic physical process th through variability and spectra, we will be able to disentangle among these processes, shock or uh, magnetic reconnection accelerated in the inner regions of these sources. So continuing, um, uh, gamma rays, uh, when... <laughs> I don't know, I have so, so much to, to talk still, okay. At least you are going to have some ideas, uh, a flavor, and then we... Okay, gamma rays will also be able to... Uh, when they, they uh, leave the source, they interact with the, the background fields, right? Integra uh, the background uh, radiation fields and uh, uh, magnetic fields of the background. And uh, so they will be able to probe because they interact with the extragalactic background light that is produced, that the infrared and optical emission produced by stars and uh, galaxies through all the evolution of the universe, we will be able to probe, to put constraints on this extragalactic background light, right? Because of these interactions. So, in order to do that, uh, so for instance, in this diagram, we have the estimated um, opacity of the EBL, the extragalactic background light, across the redshifts that will be probed by CTA. The other uh, instruments, current instruments, have only, you know, very faint constraints for this uh, EBL, and CTA will probe with this precision. The, the blue uh, shaded region around this measurement, this simulated measurement, are probed by systematic and um, statistical errors. Um, CTA will be also able to probe the intergalactic magnetic field. You know that the intergalactic magnetic field, um, uh, that the intergalactic medium is pervaded by very weak magnetic fields. And uh, because uh, when the gamma ray interacts with, um, with the background EBL, photon, they produce electron-positron pairs. These are charged particles that are deflected by any existing uh, magnetic field in this system. And because of this deflection, we are going to observe then, um, because of this production of uh, secondary electrons that are deflected, these secondary electrons in turn will produce more photons gamma ray photons, right? Because they decay, uh, interacting with the background radiation, they produce secondary uh, gamma rays. So we are going to have primary gamma rays surrounded by a halo of secondary gamma rays. And there will be also a time delay between the arrival of the primary gamma ray and the secondary gamma ray. And CTA will be able to uh, measure both these halos, these uh, uh, secondary gamma rays, halos, and these echoes. And for you to have an idea, this is, for instance, the primary, this is a, a simulation showing the halo the, of secondary gamma rays around the primary one, right? So the primary comes from the source, the secondary one is producing here. And in this diagram, we see the emission. Okay, this dashed line is the primary emission of gamma rays from the source. And this is what is absorbed. So these gamma rays are partially absorbed by EBL, but then the electron-positron pairs will emit secondary gamma rays, right? And these are the secondary contribution. So when we sum both the primary and the secondary, we have this resulting spectrum so that we can probe the EBL absorption, absorption and also infer what is the background magnetic field that produced it? Because in this simulation, is a 10 to minus 15 Gauss magnetic field in the background, right? Okay, so move on. Um, CTA will be also able to measure, to put constraints on the 
uh, so-called axon-like particles that are predicted by quantum uh, chromodynamics theory. I'm not going to discuss this, I do not have the time, but you are going to have plenty of this during this week. Um, this is a parametric space that is constrained by CTA for uh, these uh, axon-like particles. Um, sorry, let me... This is the, the diagram that probably Manuel will explain this to you guys. And let, let me talk about dark matter search. Uh, CTA will try to probe uh, the origin of cold dark matter. Right, the, 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 the if cold dark matter, the, the so-called uh, WIMPs, are, are produced by, uh, in the surroundings, in the halo of our own galactic center, or in dwarf galaxies or in clusters of galaxies, CTA will try to constrain and, uh, these, uh, these particles. Uh, when I'm talking about cold dark matter, this is the best candidate for dark matter uh, particles, right? The weakly interacting uh, massive particles, the WIMPs. And when these particles, you know, they do not interact with the baryonic matter, but they, do, they interact uh, between themselves, with, with each other. And this interaction produces gamma rays. And that's why we can uh, observe the gamma ray signature of these particles. And this diagram shows the, uh, the, the cross-section the, the sensitivity curve of CTA will be below the cross-section, the canonical cross-section for these interactions, right? This is for the galactic uh, uh, halo. And actually, this is what uh, has predicted, so it's going to be much better for the CTA. And these are the two curves, are the predictions for CTA for dark matter from LMC galaxy and from a dwarf galaxy nearby, sculpture dwarf galaxy. And, uh, okay, I do not have the time to, to explore this more further, but I should say that CTA will also probe gamma rays and dark matter in galaxy clusters. More, uh, we are currently preparing a consortium paper about Perseus cluster. I cannot uh, show the results yet because it's not published yet. But what I can tell you is that galaxy clusters are excellent uh, cosmic ray accelerators because they are able to retain these particles for the Hubble time, for the age of the universe, right? So they are able to produce gamma rays. And in this diagram that uh, we have produced the diffuse gamma ray emission from clusters between uh, uh, Z equals 0 and 5. Actually, it's a paper just accepted in Nature Communications, and it was produced by the PhD thesis of my former student. Uh, so you see, it's a, it's a field, high energy astrophysics, it's a, it's a field with uh, major possibilities for all of you guys. And uh, in this diagram, we have reproduced this shaded area uh, shows the entire diffuse gamma ray em emission produced by clusters within this size, right across, across the, the, the ages. And you see, this is the, the obs uh, observed diffuse gamma ray emission by Fermi. So for uh, values of energy above 10 to 11 electron volts or 100 GVs, all the emission could be produced by the diffuse uh, contribution, uh, the contribution to the diffuse emission could be due to clusters of galaxies. So this has an impact on the search for dark matter in, in clusters as well, right? Because you have to subtract this astrophysical sign and then you will uh, be able to see the, no the signature of dark matter. Um, uh, uh, okay. Uh, I'm not going to discuss this, that CTA will probe also constraints to the, violence, the, viol the violation of the constants of, of uh, the light speed at uh, Planck scale's limits. Um, and finally, I would like to say, in, in the few minutes that I still have, I'd like to discuss very briefly about the CTA precursor, that is the Astri Mini Array. The Astri Mini Array will be an array with nine small-sized telescopes that are being built 
by Italy, Brazil, South Africa, Spain, and more recently Switzerland. And Brazil contributed with the three of these nine structures through a, uh, a thematic project in, uh, in IAG uh, USP, coordinated by my, my, myself. And uh, it, it is currently in construction. And it is, will be operating in the early 2025. So, uh, in two years from now. And um, uh, the CTA expected performance is very similar for the largest energies because they are only small size telescopes. So they will probe the largest TV energies of the gamma ray spectrum, right? And that these energies, the sensitivity, the angular resolution, energy resolution, and field of view are similar to CTA, right? So this is a good advantage because it will be able to do good science uh, before CTA will be ready, and this will be improved by CTA then, but only at the, the largest energies. So, for instance, here we have the, the, CT, the, the sensitivity by the mini array that is, is, uh, is competitive to, it's of the order of the CTA, uh, and uh, also, uh, uh, okay, it's uh, of the order at the highest energies, and uh, and also uh, you know this is for 200 hours exposure, and it's compared here with the um, with the Lazo and the uh, Hawk, uh, and Lazo has a better sen sensitivity, but for one year exposure, right? And the angular resolution is much uh, higher because it's uh, uh, comparable to to that of CTA, and. The science at the highest energies is going to be pretty similar to the science pillars proposed by CTA. So, of, of course, exploring the highest energies. Uh, so, the pevatrons, blazers, probing, EBL, intergalactic magnetic fields, and testing Lorentz invariance violation and the ALPIS. Um, it, it will be also able to investigate the unknown sources that were discovered by LAZO, providing precise identification and information on their morphology and spectra. All this in the highest energy bands, right? And um, uh, it will also be able, for the gamma ray bursts, it will be able to probe the maximum energy, uh, the extreme energies that they can produce at EVs for redshifts up to uh, uh, point four. Um, so, in summary, okay, I, I just I have two two more slides. In summary, the Astromini Array will start scientific observations in two to five uh, with its ten field of view. It will allow us to investigate both extended sources and very crowded uh, regions with uh, several sources, like the Galactic Center, in a single pointing. With the three-minute angular resolution at TV, it will allow us, to, allow us to perform detailed morphological studies of extended sources, and its sensitivity extending up to 100 TVs will make the most sensitive uh, gamma ray sharing of uh, uh, observatory in this energy range until the, the construction of CT. Um, I should mention that... Um, uh, Brazil, uh, we are going to participate in the construction of the SSTs for the CTA South in Chile. Uh, we intend to produce the optical support structure for the 40 SST telescopes of the CTA South. And, um, okay, so CTA Observatory back to CTA is coming. Uh, the construction of the CTA South is meant to start in 2023, and it's going to last for five years, so around 2028 we expect to have CTA. And uh, in the meantime, we are going to have uh, the Astro Mini Array in 2025, and that's all. Thanks. Questions? Thank you for the lecture. Uh, first, I have a question about dark matter, and it's about the light particles. 
I mean, you say that it's possible to search for um, alien peace. So in this case, is, is, there po is there a possibility to search for other candidates, like candidates? OK, this is a good question. The only candidates that we can explore with the CTA are the uh, Axion likes, the Alps, right? And the WIMPs. Because, uh, you know, the theory, OK, WIMPs are uh, more attractive because, you know, they are compatible with the expectations for the cold dark matter, uh, the, the lambda CDM model for, uh, for cosmology, from cosmology, right? And also with the supersymmetry SM theories in quantum, <laughs> quantum gravity, right? Um, OK, so in this sense, and we know that this cold dark matter candidate that probably permeates you know, 27% of the matter in the universe is formed by this cold dark matter. And we know that their interaction allows for, you know, gamma ray production. So we have all these studies of uh, sources that we can eliminate more easily the astrophysical contribution. For instance, the surroundings of our galaxy century, we are going to make a detailed survey of the astrophysical contribution, both for, from the sources and for the diffusion emission, so that at the end we can uh, subtract this contribution, and what remains is probably dark matter. And this study was already performed. We have uh, simulated expectations in published in one of the papers that I mentioned there for the Galactic Center, and that gives that good expectation for the CTA sensitivity for the, for the cross-section of dark matter, right? This for the Galactic Century. For uh, also good candidates to explore dark matter, WIMPs at least, are dwarf galaxies. Why dwarf galaxies? Because they, are, they have huge uh, dark matter halos and the baryonic matter, you know, no, almost no gas, only stars. And so it's easier to subtract the astrophysical contribution and this, the, to have a signal, a, a good si signal of the noise for dark matter, right? But this is more is is skeptical. I showed you the sculpture prediction. Okay, the curve is there. We are going to see something, right? For clusters, this is more complicated. We have this paper in preparation the, or in the consortium that I mentioned, but I didn't show anything yet. Right? But we have to keep in mind, and that's why I showed that diagram where we could uh, perform numerical simulations involving, you know, magnetohydrodynamical cosmological simulations. We launched cosmic ray particles there, followed their, their trajectories, their emission, and could get their gamma ray emission. And they produce a, bi a very good sign on, on TV energies. Right? So we have this diffuse background in gamma rays that has to be subtracted in order to get the contribution from clusters, individual clusters in dark matter. Right? So this will, it's more speculation, I, I believe. It, we, we are going to see. Now, uh, the ALPS, uh, I didn't have the time to show, you know, this parametric space of ALPS interactions, inter interacting with the gamma rays to oscillate. So you have ALPS transforming gamma rays and vice versa. And this will change the transparency of the, of the background, right? Because you are producing extra gamma rays out of ALPS if they exist. So it will compete with EBL. EBL absorbs gamma rays, this produces gamma rays. So this will alter the information, the signal that we have in EBL as well. That's why it's important to, to look for the signal as well, right? So all we can do is to constrain the parametric space. Um, I can show the diagrams, but you guys, you are going to see more of this along this week. Huh? Yes, yes. Uh, I, I, oh, sorry. I can show you. Oh, I don't know. Uh, can I can I still project? Yeah, you you are gonna see this. You know, I'm not an expert on, the, on this at all, but this is the parametric space of these interactions. So you have uh, this uh, coupling 
factor AL uh, gamma ray coupling factor J A gamma as a function of the mass of the ALP, right? This is entire parametric space and the constraints provided by different theories or experiments. So you see that CTA is the green part will constrain more the parametric space when compared to Fermi and Lazo, because it will be able to probe uh, 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 Alps with a mass one order of magnitude larger than Fermi, for instance. You see, you, you have this displacement to the right side of this diagram. So uh, I think uh, I, I probably Manuel Meyer will discuss this in more details. Yeah, so we have just one more question because we are late in time. Hello. Uh, so uh, my question is short is, why do we use um, traditional telescopes instead of water tanks in CTA? I beg your pardon? Uh, why do we use uh, telescopes instead of water tanks in ah, CTA? In CTA, yes. Uh, I think you know the answer is when you compare the, the sensitivity, the angular resolution, all those issues, uh, you see that um, sharing of tanks, the water tanks, they can probe the, the largest energies only, right? And this is very good. They, they have very good sensitivity for exposures of one year. So they are discovering really, you know, extremely TV, PV uh, gamma rays. This is completely new. This deserved the, that nature paper by, by the Chinese people with LASO, right? With these new 12, um, 12 sources. But the problem is that the angular resolution of the tanks is so poor that you cannot identify them. You cannot provide morphology information, detailed spectral information, and CTA, the Sherenkov telescope, with these hundreds of telescopes distributed in the two hemispheres, will be able to disentangle with the arc minute resolution, right? And before CTA, the, the, the Astri Mini Array will start this job at the highest energies. So there will be a good synergy between uh, Astri Mini Array and LAZO. And by, uh, as a matter of fact, two weeks ago, we had a workshop involving Astri and LAZO in Italy, in Milano, exactly to discuss these uh, future synergies between them. And of course, you know, all of us are, belong to CTA. So we are going to learn a lot with the Astri Mini Array. And we Brazilians, we are going to start on this in 20, uh, you know, well before with the Astri Mini Array because Brazil is directly involved in the Astri Mini Array as well. So, you know, and then we move to the broad range and broad science case of CTA, hopefully in 2028 or before. Okay. So right? let's thank the speaker again. <laughs>